Hello everybody and welcome to the second uh, webinar for the Olive Wellness Institute and today we'll be covering olive leaf extract. So having a really um, excellent look at the clinical overview, we're very, very fortunate today that we have um, Ian Breakspear presenting for us. Um, he's got a wealth of knowledge in this area so I won't speak for too long before I pass over to Ian. Just a little bit of um, housekeeping before we start the session. Um, if somebody could just let us know that the audio is coming through nice and clearly through the chat box, that would be great, just so we know that we're not talking to ourselves <laughs> at the moment. Um, we are recording this session as well, so um, if you miss anything, in about a week's time we'll be sharing with you the recorded um, presentation as well. Yep, everyone's coming through. Thank you so much for telling me. So we really value your time and thank you so much for joining us today. We do have a really action-packed um, session. So as I said, I won't spend too much time chatting with you, but just a bit of housekeeping. So um, our webinar goes for about 45, 50 minutes in terms of content and then we'll have some question time. If we do go over time, we'll collate all of the questions and um, we'll send around a document to post the session with all the questions and answers that we'll um, curate through Ian as well. So please put all your questions into the question box and then I'll collect all of them and at the end I'll ask as many as I can um, to Ian. Something a little bit exciting is that if you stay on to the end of the session and click through the survey, which will pop up on your screen, um, we'll be able to check who's been able to complete that. You'll go on the draw to win uh, one of two $100 Endota gift um, spa vouchers. So a bit of an incentive to stay on to the end, not that I think we'll need that given today's uh, presentation and content. Um, and all of your microphones are already on mute, so um, no huge drama if you want to be making noise in the background. None of that will come through to us on this end. Uh, for any pharmacists on the line, this webinar is accredited for two Group 2 CPD points and there is a, a survey to complete for that. So in the post uh, email that we send around, we'll provide that link. And for anybody who's a naturopath or herbalist or complementary medicine practitioner, we also have um, NHAA approved us to put this on their website, post the recording, so they've approved it for their points um, also, which is exciting for us. So just a brief introduction about Ian. We already know there's a couple of people probably on the line that have heard Ian speak before or had him as a lecturer. But um, Ian's a naturopath, herbalist and educator with more than 25 years of experience. Um, at the moment he's a senior lecturer at Endeavour College of Natural Health and he's also in private practice in Sydney. So he focuses on helping patients particularly with cardiovascular disease and chronic inflammatory conditions. Ian's a very committed leader and I can attest to that with the help that he gives us with our institute and he's within the naturopathic profession has served on eight years of board with the NHAA where amongst other projects he has redeveloped the educational standards for herbalists and naturopaths and in 2006 he was honoured with a fellowship of the NHAA for meritorious work in the profession of herbalism. In addition to various journal publication, Ian recently co-authored a chapter on heart disease for a major Australian naturopathic textbook and is also a member of the Boundary Bend Olives Expert Scientific Advisory Committee. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Ian. We'll just pop his screen, uh, video on just so we can um, see him for a moment and then once he finishes introducing himself, I'll make your um, screen larger so you can see the PowerPoint presentation. So over to you, Ian. Thank you, Sarah and Abby, and welcome everybody to this webinar. Thank you for coming. Uh, I can see that there are a few names that I recognise in that list, as well as a bunch of others that I don't think I, I've met before. So welcome and thank you for coming and spending the time today. So today we're going to start having a look at olive leaf extract. Uh, the learning objectives for today, we're going to, by the end of this, presentation, be able to describe the different types of olive leaf extract and the preparation forms, list the bioactive components found in olive leaf extract, outline the clinical benefits and the evidence to support the use of olive leaf extract, and probably most importantly, list some patient counselling points about olive leaf extract as well. So let's get into it. Now I'm just going to quickly turn off the video here so it uh, just runs a little bit smoothly for everybody. Okay, so what is olive leaf extract? Uh, let's have a look at 
Firstly, the extraction of olive leaf extract. It's extracted obviously from the fresh or the dry leaf of Olea europea. And of course, it, it does vary a little bit in chemistry, depending upon whether you are using the fresh or dry leaf, but also depending, of course, on the solvent that's used. And the most common solvents used are water, glycerol, ethanol, or sometimes combinations thereof. Now, once it's extracted, it uh, can be turned into finished dosage forms, and these can come in a few different types. Uh, possibly the most well-known retail type preparation is the liquid preparation. Uh, so it's a liquid extract in some form, sometimes combined with other herbs, sometimes flavoured or unflavoured. Uh, it just depends on the particular preparation. It can also be turned into a dry extract, and that dry extract can be encapsulated or put into tablets as well. Moving on now to a brief overview of the chemistry of olive leaf extract. Uh, olive leaf extract is a chemically complex extract, as you would expect from any kind of herbal medicine. Uh, it's really important to realise uh, that it is irreducible in its complexity. Uh, when we're talking about a plant extract, we are usually talking about something that the pharmacological benefit comes from its complexity rather than just a single isolated constituent. Uh, now, there are some exceptions to that in herbal medicine, of course. There are some where it does actually, or it is able to be reduced to the one extract, uh, the one individual constituent or group of constituents, but for most, and especially something like olive leaf, it is quite complex. So let's take a quick look at that. Now the primary constituents that are most commonly talked about with olive leaf extract are a range of firstly secoiridoid glycosides, including oleoropine and oleacin, uh, then there's another set of phenylethanoids, uh, particularly hydroxytyrosol is the most commonly discussed, and of course a whole range of different flavonoids. Now collectively these are often referred to as biophenols. Uh, there are other minor constituents as well, we're not going to talk as much about those, but the research does indicate that they do have some level of effect as well. Uh, so the complexity, as I mentioned, is important, and we're going to go through in the actual pharmacology uh, in a moment, uh, but as you'll see shortly, that there is no one isolated constituent that seems to be responsible for the overall effect. Now, a common question when we're talking about the chemistry of uh, olive extracts is how does olive leaf compared to olive oil. Can't you just get the same effects from olive oil? Uh, well, obviously olive oil has a whole range of positive benefits, but being an oil extract of the fruit as opposed to usually a water or ethanol-based extract of the leaves, the chemistry is obviously different. Uh, extra virgin olive oil versus olive leaf extract, as you can see here looking at the main biophenols, uh, the oleoropine, the hydroxytyrosol and the total biophenols are enormously higher in olive leaf extract. In fact, the oleoropine level is 500 times higher than what you see in extra virgin olive oil. So no, they aren't quite the same. Uh, there are obviously other constituents in extra virgin olive oil that are of course not present or present at very, very low levels in the olive leaf extract. Things like your sterols and obviously fatty acids and so forth. Now moving on to the pharmacology of olive leaf extract, uh, we're going to delve a little bit into the various constituents and in vitro and in vivo data on their activity now. So uh, anti-inflammatory effect, uh, it has probably a very powerful anti-inflammatory effect due to quite a range of constituents. When we look at oleoropine, uh, when we look at some of the research on the mechanism of anti-inflammatory effect, we see that even just that one constituent impacts 
upon inflammation in various ways. Uh, it's been shown to firstly reduce leukotriene B4 production, uh, reduce the expression of tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin 1 beta production, and a range of other things as well. And just to show you again that it's not able to be reduced to one extra, one, sorry, single constituent, maslinic acid, which is a minor constituent within the olive leaf, it is, is still important there. It has also been shown to modulate nitric oxide production, INOS gene expression, interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha expression, and also cyclooxygenase 2 activity. And also it possibly reduces nuclear factor kappa B activity as well. So quite a broad range of anti-inflammatory effect here. Now looking at the antioxidant effect, uh, the oleoropine itself has been shown to reduce LDL oxidation. Uh, it's also been shown to reduce the urinary excretion of various lipid peroxidation byproducts as well, indicating that not just that it is antioxidant, but in vivo that it does reduce lipid peroxidation. The total biophenols as well are important, and in fact there is some interesting research showing that there is a synergistic antioxidant behaviour in vitro between the range of different biophenols present in olive leaf. Again, illustrating that it is more than just one constituent. Now the antihypertensive effects. Uh, this is also talked about quite a lot, and indeed it's it's probably something that uh, I personally have had the most experience with. I've been using olive leaf extract in clinical practice for, well, since I first started clinical practice in 1993. Uh, and the main use that I've had for olive leaf over that time has been in treating cardiovascular disease, particularly lowering blood pressure uh, and reducing things like fluid load in heart failure. Now the antihypertensive effect has been demonstrated, but its actual mechanism of action is not as well understood as say the anti-inflammatory or antioxidant effect. Uh, and this appears to be because it is quite complex as well. The in vitro evidence suggests that it may be a combination of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibiting effect as well as calcium channel blocking. Uh, there's also suggestions that its minor diuretic effect may also be contributing to blood pressure reduction. Uh, and along with that is restoration of normal endothelial function, which is a very interesting approach in trying to reduce blood pressure uh, rather than simply addressing central or endocrinological control of blood pressure. This is addressing the endothelial function in the artery, arteries to address blood pressure as well. So again, quite a complex and interesting range of mechanisms to achieve that antihypertensive effect. Now the hypolipidemic and antiatherogenic effect. Uh, studies in rats have shown that oleoropine as well as hydroxytyrosol and the total olive leaf extract uh, reduces total cholesterol. LDL, triglycerides, and also helps to normalize HDL and LDL ratio. Additionally, hydroxytyrosol has demonstrated anti-inflammatory, anti-platelet, and antioxidant activity in vitro and in vivo studies. Uh, and of course, as we all know now, uh, atherosclerosis is in essence an inflammatory condition. Uh, so reducing that inflammatory process systemically and obviously clearly within the arterial walls can have an impact in reducing the atherogenic potential in a patient. Now looking at the hypoglycemic and anti-diabetic effects as well, uh, in vivo research in diabetic rats and mice indicate that both oleoropine and hydroxytyrosol have a dose dependent effect in lowering blood glucose and also increasing hepatic glycogen as well. Total biophenols are potent inhibitors of advanced glycation end products uh, in animal studies and if this correlates to human usage as well it, it's quite interesting because in addition to hopefully improving blood glucose regulation in diabetic patients what this can mean is even in those with 
unfortunately still sustained hyperglycemia where things like hemoglobin a1c targets are not being met as well as would be hoped that this may reduce the risk of glycation in products that can contribute to chronic complications of diabetes. So it may be a dual level of action here in both helping improve glycemic control, but also directly reducing chronic complications of diabetes through reducing these advanced glycation end products. The antimicrobial effect, uh, what's kind of interesting is that we've known for a long time that olirupine and ligstroside are important in the plant's defence against antimicrobials. In fact, they're well known in plant chemistry as what we call phytoanticipins. Uh, these are chemicals that the plant produces in anticipation of the risk of uh, having to deal with some kind of pathogenic infection. Now, olirupine has been demonstrated to have in vitro activity against a range of viruses, including respiratory syncytial virus and parainfluenza type 3 as well. In vitro studies also indicate that RLE may prevent viral entry into cells for herpes simplex virus 1 and may also reduce HIV-1 cell-to-cell transmission and viral replication. Now, just bearing in mind, obviously, here that this is still in vitro studies uh, and as to the human application in things like HIV and HSV, that's still something to be worked on. There needs to be additional evidence here, uh, but it's, it's something that's promising to investigate further. Now let's move from the pharmacology to a bit more about the clinical usage and clinical evidence. And here I'm going to look at individual human research papers uh, and talk a little bit more about them and their relevance in practice and so forth. So firstly, let's look at cardiovascular risk reduction. And, and this is probably the most uh, close to my heart, excuse the pun, uh, given that this is a big part of my clinical practice. Now, looking at stage one hypertension, this particular paper published in 2011 uh, was comparing the conventional medication Captopril against olive leaf in the control of stage one hypertension. Now, the method uh, employed in this study, it was a double blind, double dummy RCT with a four week dietary only run in and an eight week treatment period. The participants were 232 patients with stage one hypertension. And this was diagnosed at screening and again after running, just to ensure that there was no changes in that baseline hypertension that was significant over those few weeks of running. Exclusions were many of your usual factors that you would expect, things like secondary hypertension, renal failure, heart failure, myocardial infarction or stroke in the past six months valvular disease, second or third degree heart block, and of course, pregnant and breastfeeding females. The groups, uh, two groups here, olive leaf extract and captopril. The olive leaf extract was a proprietary extract of 500 milligrams, standardized at 19.9% olirupine daily, uh, giving us approximately 100 milligrams of olirupine daily. And there were 90 participants after the running in this group. The captopril was 12.5 milligrams twice daily, titrated to 25 milligrams twice daily at end of week two in non-responders. Uh, and of course, both groups got the respective dummy medications as well. The outcome measures that they're looking at, uh, the primary outcome measures, reduction in systolic blood pressure from baseline to week eight. And the secondary outcome measures included reduction in systolic and diastolic pressure from baseline to each post-treatment visit, improvement in blood lipid profiles from baseline to week four and week eight. Now looking at the results, um, they applied a per protocol analysis for blood pressure. Uh, and I'm quoting here, comparable blood pressure lowering effects to that shown by Captopril. 
The difference between groups in terms of reduction of systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure were found statistically and clinically insignificant. So essentially what this study itself was demonstrating that at least in these patients, there seemed to be clinical equivalence between the commonly used captopril and olive leaf extract in stage one hypertension. The per protocol analysis for lipids this time, um, there was a significant reduction in total cholesterol and triglyceride levels in the olive leaf extract group. Uh, of course, no significant change with the captopril, which of course is to be expected. It's not known to lower blood lipids. Uh, the subgroup of patients given the olive leaf extract that had a high baseline triglyceride level had a very significant reduction of 23.2%, which is clinically extremely significant. Uh, now, certainly, I would say that this is not uh, an effect that you would see replicated all the time in clinical practice, uh, but I have seen a number of patients getting pretty decent reduction in their triglyceride levels with sustained and higher dose olive leaf extract administration. There was also a slight reduction in LDL levels from baseline, no effect on HDL levels. Now, just looking at the discussion and limitation here, um, another eight week study also employing exactly the same extract at the same dosage, looking at 40 borderline hypertensive monozygotic twins showed only a minor reduction in the blood pressure, but interestingly, they also increased the dosage to 1,000 milligrams daily of the extract, giving approximately 200 milligrams of olirupine daily, and that showed a more clinically significant effect. So moving now to our second uh, piece of human research evidence here, we're going to look at infection, inflammation and immune compromised states. And in this case, we're going to look at oral mucositis in chemotherapy patients. Uh, this was published in 2013. And the method here, again, a randomized double blind, uh, placebo controlled, this time crossover study with a comparator medication. And the study was 15 days uh, duration of treatment during each phase with the crossovers occurring as different cycles of chemotherapy were commenced. The participants, 40 were screened, 31 randomized, 25 completed all three crossover phases. The groups um, all were employing mouth rinse solutions three to four times daily for 14 days. The three different preparations used though, uh, olive leaf extract, 333 milligrams per mil. Now, unfortunately in this study, it wasn't declared what the olirupine or hydroxytyrosol or any of the other chemical markers, what their levels were in this extract. Uh, it was just stated the amount of olive leaf extract. Uh, one preparation, another, sorry, the other preparation used was benzodiamine hydrochloride, and then finally the placebo, which was normal saline. The outcome measures employed, uh, the oral mucositis assessment scale, the WHO score, and also they looked at salivary assays for interleukin-1 beta and TNF-alpha. Now the results, uh, as you can see here in these tables, firstly looking at just table three, the mean OMAS score uh, for the tested drugs compared to placebo and the drugs compared to olive leaf, olive leaf compared to placebo. Uh, as you can see here at day eight and day 15, uh, olive leaf had the greatest level of response in reducing the OMAS. Uh, placebo, as would it be expected, didn't significantly reduce the response. There was some reduction, but not as much as desired, obviously. The benzodiamine did reduce the effect, sort of did reduce the mucositis score somewhat, uh, but again, olive leaf extract uh, was quite significantly better here. Looking at the WHO score here, uh, again, comparing the benzodiamine, the olive leaf and the placebo at different stages and looking at the different grades and the number of patients that had that grade as well. 
Uh, again, what we see here, particularly at day 15, uh, is that there were more patients in the grade zero uh, for the olive leaf and less patients in grade two uh, for the olive leaf. And that was quite a significant result. There is, as you can see as well, day three, there were some patients with a higher score in the WHO grading for olive leaf compared to benzodiamine uh, and also compared to placebo. So there was some interesting trends there in terms of changing the overall balance, but some of the more severe stages were still higher in that group as well. Now, overall, the discussion and limitations, it is a small study size, 40 patients, uh, ending up in only 31 that were actually looked at. Uh, the olive leaf group did have significantly higher TNF alpha and interleukin 1 beta levels at baseline compared to the benzodiamine and saline groups. Uh, even though the randomization seemed to be successful, that was something that was observed and probably, again, a bit of an artifact of having a relatively small sample size. Um, however, post-treatment means were still lower for the olive leaf extract compared to the other groups, with the olive leaf being the only one to show statistically significant change in the TNF alpha and the IL-1 beta as well. Now moving on to our third study, uh, looking at this time at pre-diabetic states and type 2 diabetes. Uh, and this is looking, this particular paper published in 2013, is looking at olive leaf extract in insulin sensitivity in overweight middle-aged males. Now, the study summary, it was double-blind placebo-controlled crossover RCT. Uh, 12 week intervention period, six week washout period. 46 overweight males participated with a BMI between 25 to 30, and they were all aged between 35 to 55 years. Exclusions were any illicit drug use or tobacco usage, diabetes, any medications likely to affect insulin sensitivity. And also if on antihypertensive or hypolipidemics, then they had to have a stable dosage for at least six months prior. Additionally, they were instructed not to make changes to their diet or to physical, physical activity during the trial. The groups, uh, olive leaf extracts uh, in safflower oil in capsules, uh, four capsules daily, standardized to approximately 51.1 milligrams of oleoropine and 9.7 milligrams of hydroxytyrosole per day. And also a safflower oil placebo was the other group, again, four capsules per day. Uh, the capsules were coloured to ensure that they were not able to be distinguished from each other. The outcome measures looked at, uh, the primary outcome measure was insulin sensitivity assessed by the glucose tolerance testing. Uh, the secondary included pancreatic beta cell function calculated from the GTT. The fasting blood cytokines were also taken. Fasting blood lipids, liver function tests, 24 hour BP monitoring prior to each clinical assessment and carotid intima media thickness was also assessed. Now the results uh, in the OLE group, group using the intention to treat analysis, 15% uh, improvement in insulin sensitivity, 28% improvement in pancreatic beta cell function, and 32% increase in interleukin-6, with no observed changes in interleukin-8, TNF-alpha, or CRP. And this is a quite fascinating, uh, because interleukin-6, as we know, is an inflammatory cytokine, uh, and it was interesting to see that elevate, but other inflammatory cytokines not being elevated. And the authors speculated that indeed this may be part of the mechanism in blood sugar reduction from olive leaf extract because interleukin-6 does increase glucose uptake in cells as well. 
So interesting uh, to consider that may be part of the mechanism and that it didn't seem to induce a broad inflammatory change given there were no changes to the other cytokines. No significant changes were observed in blood lipids. In no significant changes were observed in blood lipids, in blood pressure, or carotid intermamedia thickness. The safety, one adverse event reported uh, and led to withdrawal, and when this was unblinded, they saw that this patient was actually on the placebo, uh, and somehow or other it ended up with an acne flare-up, which obviously, um, assuming the, the participant had blamed on the study medication, uh, but as we say, uh, when it was unblinded, it was revealed he was on placebo anyway. There were no changes in the LFTs observed, which is always a good thing because, as, as we know, there's quite a lot of talk about herbal medicines and the risk that they may cause in liver function changes. And certainly there are some issues in herbal medicine around liver function changes, particularly with issues of adulteration and contamination of herbal material and improper usage of herbal material, uh, improper dosage, etc., that can contribute to liver function abnormalities in some cases. So it's always nice to see a study that just looks at this as a routine part of investment investigation uh, to uh, determine whether that is a safety risk in that particular substance. Now the discussion here, um, what was what I found quite fascinating in reading this, we speculate that the observed improvement in insulin sensitivity with olive leaf extract is greater than would have otherwise been observed if our subjects have been treated with metformin instead. Um, so that was quite interesting given that obviously metformin is, is one of the classic first line treatments these days for those that are potentially pre-diabetic and certainly early stage type 2 diabetes. The olive leaf extract also improved insulin secretion to further aid glucose regulation, which of course doesn't occur with the use of metformin. Now the limitations here, um, it was interesting to note given the other studies we've looked at that there was no impact on blood lipids or blood pressure. Uh, and this may have been due to a relatively low dose of olirupine. Um, certainly I'm speculating that that dosage of around 51 milligrams of olirupine per day uh, would probably be lower than what I would give almost all of my patients uh, in practice. So that's a potential issue there. And certainly looking at the other studies that did show positive effects on blood lipids and blood pressure, they were employing extracts with higher levels of total olirupine. It also warrants further investigation though, um, particularly around this dose response. It'd be interesting to see more studies evaluating in larger groups of people what different dosages of olive leaf uh, result in, you know, the levels of change in particularly early stage hypertension uh, compared to various dosage levels. Now that uh, wraps up those uh, main human studies, but I just want to touch on now some promising activity that is requiring future human research here as well. Um, so more work is definitely needed in these areas and uh, what I find particularly interesting is neuroprotective activity with in vitro research indicating that olirupine may reduce amyloid plaque formation and deposition and that olive leaf extracts reduced infarct volume, brain edema and blood brain barrier permeability as well as neurological deficit scores in rats after cerebral arterial inclusion. So this is quite interesting here. And, and what I find interesting is that there's a number of different plants with particularly high biophenol contents, particularly flavonoids and so forth, that do have similar research indicating that they can reduce things like infarct volume, 
and have some neuroprotective effect. Uh, there's a whole range of medicinal plants that have growing and interesting research in this area that have somewhat similar chemistry here. So it's, it's a little trend that we're seeing. So it'll be interesting to see how this uh, plays out over the next few years as more time and more money is invested in the research and that hopefully we start to move to early stage human pilot studies and beyond. Anti-cancer and anti-angiogenic effect as well. Uh, there's obviously a fair amount of epidemiological evidence for lower incidence of some types of cancer being associated with the Mediterranean diet in general. And obviously there's a lot more to the Mediterranean diet than just olive leaves. Olive leaves would obviously be a relatively small part. Whilst they were drunk uh, traditionally as a tea, it wasn't on a daily basis in most situations. Uh, and obviously the Mediterranean diet consists of a lot more than just olive leaf, olive oil, a whole range of different food choices and so forth. What is interesting though here as well is that olirupine has demonstrated some anti-proliferative, anti-angiogenic and of course antioxidant activity in vitro as well. So again, more, a lot more work needed here but interesting starting point. Now moving on to safety and patient counselling. Uh, and of course safety needs to be considered here. Any medication, whether it be herbal, any supplement or any conventional medication always comes with some level of risk. Uh, so it's always important to ensure that we understand what that risk is and we minimise the risk through that understanding and through applying sensible practices. Now looking at the adverse events reported in that olive leaf versus captopril study, uh, particularly interesting here is there was a relatively large group of patients compared to some of the other human studies on olive leaf. And here a total of 1057 adverse events were reported by 168 study subjects. 83 subjects belong to the olive group, 85 to the captopril group, so similar here. The majority of adverse events were tolerably mild, 99.8%, and were comparable between groups. There was one serious adverse event recorded in the olive leaf group, uh, and this patient uh, was diagnosed with severe anemia following persistent menorrhagia. Uh, that was judged to be unrelated to the OLE. There was quite a lot of other confounding factors in that particular participant, so yes, that was judged to be separate. Now the European Medicines Agency has also had a look at olive leaf. Uh, they published a assessment report on olive leaf in 2012. Uh, and the safety results uh, obtained from the clinical studies conducted so far show that the oral use of olive leaf extracts are well tolerated by most patients. The majority of adverse events were tolerably mild while the most common ones, 5% of the total events observed during the studies, were coughing and vertigo, 46 and 5.9% respectively in the olive group. Less frequently, muscle discomfort and headache were reported. There are no reported drug-related serious or moderate adverse events. Now, moving on to interactions as part of safety, uh, this is something that requires a lot more investigation because to be honest at the moment, uh, we're pretty much only theorizing based upon mechanisms of action and known pharmacology of olive leaf versus various other pharmaceutical medications. Uh, and it is only theorizing at this point, there's not enough human data to know the impact of these interactions. But it's important to consider what are the possibilities here. Uh, and of course, antihypertensive agents, there's the possibility that there might be an additive effect. And of course, it would be advisable to consult a healthcare practitioner prior to using in a patient that was already taking pharmaceutical medications for their hypertension. Now, I can tell you personally from my clinical experience in treating a, a very large number of patients with hypertension over the years that olive leaf does have some additive effect with any hypertensive agents. 
Uh, and usually that is a good thing under the care of a healthcare practitioner. Because as we know, there's a lot of patients whose control of their blood pressure may not be quite ideal for a number of reasons. And what I've found is that adding olive leaf extract as a part of their therapy can improve that overall blood pressure control uh, and in some cases reduce the need for elevations of dosage in their pharmaceutical antihypertensive medications. Similar issues can be observed with hypoglycemic agents as well. So again, care is noted here and warranted. Uh, and of course, consulting a healthcare practitioner again is essential. Contraindications and precautions. Um, there you know, has been some reports of hypersensitivity to olive leaf extract. Yeah, after all, it is a plant extract, so allergy is a possibility. Um, some of these have been unusual usage. Uh, there was one report of local allergic reaction in the eyes through topical use of olive leaf extract on the eyes. Um, not something I would suggest at this stage, uh, but obviously something that was conducted by that individual. Uh, so obviously if there is a known allergy to olive products, then avoidance would be good. Safety during pregnancy and breastfeeding has not been established. Uh, this stage, looking at the chemistry, there's no reason to suspect that there would be a problem. But of course, at this stage, we don't have the human data or even very good animal data to understand the safety there. And in cases of renal disorders or patients taking diuretics, again, it makes sense to consult a healthcare professional prior to usage. So looking now at how can we administer olive leaf? Uh, what is the best way or best ways of administering it? So some general guidelines, tablets, capsules, and oral liquids are available. Now for things like uh, the mucositis uh, that we looked at with that human study previously, or to be honest, any oral or nasopharyngeal infection or inflammation, it probably would be advisable to use a liquid preparation to maximize the local contact with the area uh, to improve the activity. Uh, something to note though, is that liquid preparations are bitter and it's unavoidable. Oliorupine is a secoiridoid glycoside. Um, most secoiridoids are inherently quite bitter. Uh, whilst glycerol as an extraction medium being sweet uh, or flavouring agents can improve the taste of it, the bitterness is going to be there. Uh, and in fact, if it's not bitter, that's a, an unfortunate sign that the product quality may not be ideal and may not actually contain the desired amounts of oleoropein because it should be bitter with that oleoropein content. It's obviously advisable to talk to people about that, make sure they're aware that there will be some bitterness there. Um, it's not intolerable, particularly if there is something like glycerol as an extraction medium or flavoring agent there, it does reduce that issue significantly. Now, just something I want to mention here, um, and this is unpublished research that I'm in the process process of conducting at the moment and will be presenting uh, at an international conference in Melbourne in March and also another in Brisbane in uh, May. Uh, and this has been looking at olive leaf extracts and comparing their phytochemistry. Uh, and this came out of a clinical question I had, which was which olive leaf extract am I going to use in practice? Which one should I be using in practice? And is the one that I've currently been using in practice ideal, is there something better and so forth. Uh, and so uh, what was very nice with this is that the Olive Wellness Institute uh, decided to back my question on this and supported me through this research here. So this uh, data will be presented as I say at a couple of international conferences coming up in the next couple of months. But as you can see here, not all olive leaf extracts are equal. This is looking at milligrams per kilo of polyurepine, hydroxytyrosol, and total biophenols. And as you can see, even the ratios between things like the polyurepine and total biophenols can vary dramatically. Uh, so this is interesting. This is only a small sample from my research at the moment. So if you're interested, I encourage you to come along to those conferences, uh, but certainly it's opened my eyes as well as to what is most appropriate to use in practice. 
suggested duration of usage. Uh, now, this is something where we're largely reliant upon relatively short trials. Obviously, trials do have a limited time frame, uh, and most of them are relatively short. Uh, and otherwise, we're relying on traditional usage information in terms of suggested duration of usage. Now, the traditional usage uh, information here falls down a little bit because for most of the traditional usage, it has been focused on things like infection, acute inflammation, and so forth. So it has been, by nature, relatively short-term usage. Uh, what is interesting, though, is, of course, the cardiovascular risk reduction, diabetes, and pre-diabetic states. This is likely to require continual usage. Uh, and this is something we, we don't have a lot of research on continual usage. But again, there's no reasons to suspect that there could be a problem from this based on the short and medium term human trials that have been done so far. For infections, though, two to four weeks should be enough to achieve the desired result. Uh, if symptoms do persist, of course, consulting a healthcare professional as well. Uh, and this is particularly important because a lot of people do self-medicate with olive leaf extract from retail applications and they don't have any advice from a health professional on that application of olive leaf extract. So wherever possible, particularly if you are in retail uh, pharmacy, retail naturopathy, any kind of retail contact with patients, uh, is to advise them that if they are having these symptoms persisting, then they do need to see a health professional. Something I also want to encourage here is that when we're talking to people, particularly again in that retail context, if they are taking olive leaf extract, that they are encouraged to inform their health providers, uh, all of their health providers that they're taking it. A uh, common problem that we note with a lot of complementary medicines is that communication about that usage is often much lower than what we desire. And that's been seen in a lot of different research studies and surveys uh, to date. Uh, and it's important, I think, for all health professionals in the care of a patient to understand what medicines are being taken by that patient, whether they're pharmaceutical medicines, herbal medicines, nutritional supplementation, etc. I think it's very important that everybody is aware. So that wraps it up for me. Uh, thank you for coming and participating today. Uh, obviously, there are some questions here, and I'm going to turn it over to Sarah now to ask those questions, and hopefully I can uh, generate some answers for you. Great. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, that was wonderful. Um, I think you covered so much ground in that presentation. I'm sure everybody on the line is grateful, so thank you. Um, we had only had a couple of questions come through, so um, we'll if any, uh, anyone has any questions post this session, feel free to email us at the Institute. But I'll ask a couple that have come through, and one which probably dovetails nicely in into your last point is, um, and I think you've already answered this, but maybe just to reiterate it is, um, one delegate's asked, can you use OLE with prescribed medicines for blood pressure? So I think we've covered that as well. Um, any other comments to make on how you deal with that in a clinical sort of setting? Yeah, it's, it's a very important question, um, and I do believe that you can, in most cases, use olive leaf extract in conjunction with various any hypertensive agents. Uh, I certainly do in my practice, uh, but again, I do encourage that it's only done in the context of yeah, healthcare professional understanding that the, the patient is also taking olive leaf extract because obviously if it is improving the results or if it's not having the desired effect, the, the health professionals caring for that patient do need to know. Um, I have seen in a couple of patients as well where the efficacy of combined care, so conventional pharmaceutical care, as well as olive leaf and various other herbal medicines, has in some cases had a very significant effect on blood pressure to the point where the patients, particularly some elderly patients, have been getting borderline hypotensive. So again, monitoring is essential here to avoid the, the risk of hypotensive complications of fatigue, confusion, and so forth, uh, particularly in elderly patients. Yeah. So yeah. 
Okay. Thank you. The questions are flooding through now, Ian, so we're good. <laughs> um, the next question I've got is uh, the anti-inflammatory effects of olive leaf extract. Are they only um, sort of experienced when eating or are they also um, experienced with any topical application to your knowledge? Yeah, good question. Um, topical applications in things like the oral mucosa, uh, nasopharyngeal area, definitely that is relevant. Uh, as to potentially skin application, there's a little bit of information on that, but it, it, it's not that conclusive at this stage. I personally haven't used olive leaf topically on any kind of dermatitis, mm. um, so I'm not sure of, of the clinical benefit there. Um, certainly, it wouldn't be my yeah. first choice in dermatitis, but for things like nasopharyngeal oral inflammation, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I agree with you too there, Ian. In terms of other research we've done through the Institute, there's not a wealth of information apart from that oral mucositis study that assesses the topical um, application and clinical effects of olive leaf extract. So it's, it's certainly a space for more research, I think. Um, another great question, which is a very common one. Um, have any studies been done looking at OLE for the treatment of colds and flus? What's your thoughts on that one there, Ian? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, not really in the human area. Obviously, there's a lot of in vitro stuff on antiviral effects, etc. Uh, but in terms of human studies on colds and flus, as we know, they're inherently difficult to investigate anyway, uh, given the nature of your average mm. upper respiratory infection being self-limiting within a week or so anyway. Uh, it's always difficult to study the impact on things like duration of the common cold uh, after a particular medication is administered, prevention of the common cold, etc. Very difficult to study in the large groups, etc. So it would be interesting if somebody could do that. Um, it, yeah, it certainly has been yeah. <laughs> other things. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I would say from my clinical usage, um, definitely relevant in the treatment, possibly relevant in the prevention of common colds, um, yeah. but yeah, yeah. more data necessary, more investigation necessary. Yeah, completely agree. I think the re other research we've done as well shows that it's particularly traditional uh, reference sources that are lent, lent upon for that kind of um, claim or indication on products, which are still a valid indications and claims. They just hold a different set of evidence, which is certainly not related to human evidence of use. So couldn't agree with you more there. Get that question a lot. <laughs> um, up to you whether you want to answer this one because we don't normally talk to brands on the Olive Lawns Institute so we can take this offline if needed to. But someone's asked, do you have any recommendations for any high quality products in Australia? So up to you whether you feel comfortable answering that or not. Ian. <laughs> yes, it's always an interesting <laughs> question. Um, look, at this stage, yeah. as I say, my research is still in progress. So I don't want to give yeah. a complete answer on that. But uh, yeah, I, I do encourage anybody to come along to, to the conference and hear the results of the final research yeah. <laughs> on that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you there. And a couple of people have asked for details. So certainly in the follow-up to this webinar session, we'll provide you with the email address of M, sorry, details where Ian's presenting. And of course, keep you on the, um, the distribution list to receive the paper once it becomes circulated. There's a link to it. Um, one question here is whether the liquid efficacy of the liquid preparation is better than a solid dosage form. Yeah, that one's interesting, and I, I, I don't think there's any simple answer to this. Um, I think it, it go. I think the question that is more important here is how was it originally extracted? What solvents were used? Was it the fresh? Was it the dry? Um, rather than whether it's been turned into a dry extract or turned into a liquid extract. Uh, I think that's more important here. So, you know, there, there's often, and particularly I know in, in the herbal medicine and naturopathic area, there's a, often the idea that uh, liquids will be better than solid dosage forms for various herbal medicines. But, yeah, it's not yeah. a simple thing to answer. So, yeah, there's a lot of steps in the process uh, of extracting olive leaf, obviously. And um, yeah. it depends on how it's done. 
and yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Thank you. On um, another one. So, um, the patients you mentioned using OLE during chemo, did they only use it as a mouthwash with no ingest ingestion, or would there be benefit of them both using it as a mouthwash and also ingesting the product? To what you've um, read in the literature. Yeah, interesting. Um, from what I remember in the description of the study, it was only a mouthwash. I can't remember whether the patients were mm. instructed to spit uh, at the end of, of rinsing their mouth. Um, I'm assuming that was the case. I can't quite remember off the top of my head. Uh, but I certainly would not see any harm yeah. in, in swallowing for olive leaf extract as well, uh, particularly if there was any issues with things like the inflammation extending further down into the gastrointestinal area, you know, yeah. esophagus, uh, gastritis and stuff like that. that might yeah, be and also we'll uh, also do all these Q&As in the PDF for everybody on the session, so maybe we can even go back and double check what the paper said, but yeah, I can't remember either, to be honest. <laughs> um, another one, uh, we've got another question around which product you recommend, and we might just park that as well, um, because as Ian mentioned, there will be more to come on that with some, some research coming out. So we'll just hold that so we can actually show the full clinical research. So I'll, I'll miss that question temporarily. Um, another one. Um, Ian, you mentioned not all OLE are the same and therefore do not have the same therapeutic outcomes or desired outcomes, sorry. Um, in your mind, which is the key product characteristic which delivers an effective outcome? I think essentially the um, delegates are asking which which unique characteristic of an olive leaf extract makes it have the best desired outcome. I think you've kind of covered that in terms of needing to have the right levels of the oligopine, hydroxytyrosol and total phenols. But are there any other, is there a key product characteristic of all of those that you would say is necessary to deliver the outcome needed when someone's taking olive leaf extract? Yeah, so, so far from a combination of, of the profiling, phytochemical profiling research that I'm doing as well as application in clinical practice, my, my clinical practice, uh, I do think that in some way or other the ratio between things like olirupine and total biophenols is important uh, because certainly uh, I, in clinical practice I have been observing slightly less benefit from those extracts that tend to have a reversal of the normal ratio of olirupine to total biophenols where the olirupine is relatively low but total biophenols are high. Um, that doesn't seem to be as desirable to me. Obviously this is my observations in practice, so there's a lot of limitations to that. Uh, okay, thank you. That's certainly um, a, a couple of questions around the wholesale availability of, of olive leaf extract. We'll, we'll provide a response to um, delegates after the session. Just the Olive Wellness Institute doesn't typically mention or recommend brands, but we can give you a variety of links. It's a particular USA question to, to see you in the right direction, so we'll just pass that at the moment. We'll get through probably two more questions and we'll put the rest of the questions in a QA and a doc because they're flooding through and I'm conscious we're finishing at one and people could have other engagements. So just two more. Um, does any data exist into the safety alongside chemotherapy or radiotherapy given the antioxidant profile of OLA? Yeah, not to my knowledge on concurrent usage uh, orally and systemically of olive leaf in that context. It's a very good question though because there is a lot of debate around various chemotherapeutic agents uh, combined with herbal antioxidants or nutritional antioxidants and certainly there's some evidence on other antioxidant products reducing the efficacy of the chemotherapy agent. Mm. So it's definitely a legitimate question. It warrants more investigation. To my knowledge, there's not uh, any real investigation specifically. Okay. Um, and what about, do you know of any research around OLE with shingles outbreaks? Is there anything that you found when you were looking through the literature with respect to that? Uh, 
Uh, mostly around just uh, in vitro studies, in vivo animal studies with uh, with the herpes viruses uh, and showing mm -hmm. reduction in viral load a couple of times in things like viral expression, etc. Um, as to human usage, uh, there is a moderate amount of anecdotal use. Uh, sorry, anecdotal evidence here of people using it in the treatment of uh, cold sores. Uh, in terms of shingles, <laughs> okay. yeah. yeah, not not really sure on that. Um, I, I it certainly wouldn't be my first line of, of choice uh, of herbal medicine. Okay, medicines. great. Thanks very much. There have been a ton of other questions, Ian. So as I said, we'll put them together for everybody and send around um, the information. Thank you to everybody for joining. Particularly thank you, Ian. It's a wonderful presentation and the level of engagement just shows to, is a testament to that, I think. So we'll get through all the questions, I promise. Um, a little bit of just end housekeeping. We will send around a PDF of the slides to everybody, um, a link to the recording. The recording can take some time to, to come into us, so it'll be a few days at least. Um, and we'll also, um, for anybody who's doing this and is a pharmacist or is looking for the pharmacist CPD points, we'll provide information on how you achieve your certificate and your Group 2 credits um, also. So what I'm going to do now is launch a survey and as I mentioned, everybody who enters the survey, you go on the door to win one of two vouchers. Um, we do have some international guests, which is fantastic, so um, should one of those be successful, we'll give an equivalent voucher to an Indosia voucher of one that is actually available in your, your geographical location. So I'm going to start the survey, it will be online for the whole time, so please continue to type through questions and also if you've got any other questions at any time, please email us at the Institute. So um, our email address is accessible through all the contact we've made for this session, but it's info at olivewellnessinstitute.org. So I'm going to launch the survey. Thanks very much, and uh, feel free to stay online and pass through any feedback. Thank you so much.